So what I want to do with this video is start talking about cardiac output. So cardiac output is a measurement that's calculated often clinically because it gives us information about how the heart is actually functioning. So I'm going to give you just kind of a definition of what cardiac output is, and then we'll go into how it's actually calculated. And then the last thing that we'll do with this particular video is talk a little bit about some things that can affect cardiac output to cause it to increase or cause it to decrease. So here's a working definition of what cardiac output is. It's the amount of blood pumped by the left ventricle in one minute. So another way of thinking about this is it's the amount of blood that's being pushed into the systemic circuit in a minute's time, or it's the amount of blood that's going out to the tissues of the body to provide those tissues with oxygen and nutrients in a minute's time. Here's a formula for calculating cardiac output. So cardiac output, which you'll often just see abbreviated as CO, is equal to the heart rate, which is the number of times that the heart beats in a minute, times what's known as the stroke volume. So stroke volume basically is the amount of blood that is pushed into the circuit with each contraction of the heart. So the amount of blood that's moving basically from the left ventricle up into the aorta with each contraction is what is referred to as the stroke volume. So what I want to do next, now that we've kind of defined what cardiac output is, and we've come up with the formula for how, calculate, how you actually calculate cardiac output, what I want to do is talk about some things based mathematically on this formula that can cause cardiac output to change. So that can either cause increases in cardiac output or that can cause decreases in cardiac output. So if you remember back to our formula for cardiac output, cardiac output is equal to the heart rate times the stroke volume. So effectively, anything that changes the heart rate, anything that changes the stroke volume is going to cause a change in the overall cardiac output. If you think about heart rate, this is really quite simple. If the heart's rate increases, so if it's beating more times in a minute because you're exercising or whatever, you're going to see a corresponding increase in cardiac output. If your heart rate slows down because you're not stressed, you're relaxing, you're asleep, you're going to see a decrease in cardiac output. And that makes sense because under stressed or exercising conditions, when heart rate is higher, your tissues need a higher volume of blood. You need a higher cardiac output to be able to sustain the tissues and the organs of your body. When you're under relaxed resting conditions, we don't need cardiac output to be so high because the demand of the tissues for oxygen and for nutrients is not as high under those situations. So those are heart rate's effects and they're pretty direct and I think a little bit more easy to understand. We've talked about what stroke volume is, basically that it's the amount of blood that gets pushed from the left ventricle into the systemic circuit with each contraction of the heart. So anything that affects stroke volume is also going to be affecting cardiac output. We've actually got a formula for calculating stroke volume. So I want to talk about this formula a little bit because we're going to be using it as we continue on with this video. So stroke volume is equal to what's known as the EDV. So EDV is the end diastolic volume. It's the volume of blood in the left ventricle at the end of diastole or at the end of the relaxation of the heart. Remember that it's during the relaxation that the heart is filling with blood. So our EDV or our end diastolic volume is going to be the volume of blood that's in the left ventricle at the end of filling. This is going to be the highest volume of blood. So stroke volume is equal to this EDV minus what's known as ESV. So if you look down here, we've got our definition of ESV, this is the end systolic volume. Systole is the time when the heart is contracting. So systole is the time when blood is being pushed from the left ventricle out of the left ventricle into the aorta. So the volume of blood at the end of systole, at the end of contraction in the left ventricle is our end systolic volume. If you look at these pictures down here, this kind of represents it a little bit more visually. Sometimes these collaborate sessions miss up my PowerPoint. So we have a minus sign that's missing from here that I'm gonna go ahead and draw in. But our stroke volume is equal to 
in diastolic volume, so that's the volume of blood in the left ventricle at the end of filling, basically when the left ventricle is full, minus the in systolic volume, which is the volume of blood that's in the ventricle, in the left ventricle specifically at the end of contraction. And if you look down here, you'll notice there's a little bit of blood that's still sitting down there in the left ventricle at the end of systole, all of the rest of the blood that was here has been pushed up into the aorta, so it's been pushed into the systemic circuit, and that's our stroke volume. So basically what we started with minus what we end up with is our stroke volume. It's going to be the volume of blood that got pushed into the aorta or got pushed into the systemic circuit. So because stroke volume is equal to the EDV minus the ESV, anything that affects EDV or ESV is going to affect the stroke volume. And because it affects the stroke volume, it's going to affect the cardiac output. So I've got a list of three things on this slide that affect EDV or in some cases ESV. And because of that affects stroke volume and therefore affect the cardiac output. So what I want to do with this slide is talk about what these three things are, kind of define them for you, look at whether they're affecting ESV or EDV, and then with the last slide, we'll talk a little bit about how they're affecting EDV or ESV and what effect that translates to with cardiac output. So the first thing that I have on this list is the preload, and I've got my kind of simplified drawing of a heart over here with some arrows drawn into it to represent which what each of these three different things are. So the preload is blood that's returning to the heart. This is the blood that's coming in from the systemic circulation and from the pulmonary circulation into the heart. Um, this is going to be based on what's known as venous return. So venous return is how quickly that blood is returning. And there are situations where we see blood returning to the heart faster. For example, when you're exercising, heart rate increases. The faster that blood goes out to the body, the faster it's going to come back to the heart. And so venous return is increased under an exercising situation. Um, if you're resting, if you're relaxed, we're going to see blood returning to the heart at a slower rate, um, maybe than what you would see under active conditions. So venous return can change. And venous return is basically what the preload is. It's how much blood is returning to the heart. If you think about what preload is, okay, by definition, it's blood returning to the heart. So the faster the blood returns to the heart, the more blood we're going to have in the left ventricle at the end of diastole. The slower the blood returns to the heart, the less blood we're going to have in the ventricles at the end of diastole. So preload is affecting specifically the EDV or the end diastolic volume. It's affecting how much blood is in the left ventricle at the end of diastole or at the end of filling. Contractility is basically how strongly the heart is contracting. So if you look at these arrows over here, you'll notice I've got these arrows that are just pointing inward. They are meant to represent a squeezing of the heart, which is really what contractility is. It's how strongly the heart is contracting. If the heart contracts stronger, such as under an exercise condition or under a condition of being stressed, sometimes you'll start to really feel your heart pound. That's when that contractility has increased. And if the heart is contracting with more force, it makes sense that it's going to push more blood than it otherwise would out of the body. If it's contracting with less force because maybe you're in heart failure or maybe it's just you're relaxing, you're not stressed, then it's not going to push as much blood out of its chambers and specifically out of the left ventricle as it otherwise would. So what contractility affects is the ESV which you'll remember is the end systolic volume. It's the volume of blood in the heart following contraction or in the left ventricle specifically following contraction. And if that left ventricle has a high contractility, it's going to push more blood out. So your ESV is going to be less. There's going to be less blood left in the ventricle after that heart contracts with a lot of force. If your contractility has decreased, maybe because of heart failure or whatever, 
It's not going to be able to squeeze as hard. There's going to be more blood sitting in the left ventricle following contraction. And that means that that in systolic volume, which is that volume left following contraction of blood in the heart is going to increase. The third thing here is afterload. And to talk about afterload, I'm going to draw you a terrible picture and you're going to see why I teach anatomy and physiology and not art. Here's my silly representation of a heart because it's the best I can do. And actually that heart turned out pretty good. I'm pretty proud. Um, here is my representation of the left ventricle and also of the aorta coming up off of the left ventricle. And you guys know that sitting in between the left ventricle and the aorta is a valve which is known as the aortic semilunar valve. So that's right there. After load is back pressure on the heart. And that's my dog. After load is back pressure on the heart. So it's pressure that the heart is having to overcome in order to move blood from the left ventricle in the, into the aorta. One thing that you should know about blood is it always moves from an area of higher pressure to an area of lower pressure. So if we want the blood that's in the left ventricle to move up into the aorta, we've got to generate a higher pressure here in the left ventricle than the pressure that's in the aorta. And if we do that, if we generate a higher pressure down in here, then we overcome the afterload and that opens up this valve and allows the blood to move from an area where we've generated a higher pressure into an area where there's a lower pressure. Afterload really starts to have its effects on the heart. So this back pressure on the heart that the heart has to overcome to move blood from the left ventricle into the aorta, it really starts to have its effect in hypertensive situations. And I wanna give you an example of why. So let's say that a normal healthy blood pressure in the aorta is equal to 120 over 80. I actually don't even know if that's true. That's normal for the brachial artery. I don't know what it is in the aorta, but it's gonna be somewhere close to that. If that's the case, the normal blood pressure in the aorta is equal to 93. So that's our average. If you're looking at that and saying, hey, that's not a straight average, you're right, it's not. The way that we calculate the average blood pressure in a blood vessel is a little bit different. And we're gonna get into that in the blood pressure exercise, but just trust me on this for now. What that means basically is if the left ventricle wants to move blood up into the aorta, and we've got a normal healthy average blood pressure of 93 through here, then the left ventricle is gonna have to generate a pressure of 94 to get that blood to move from the left ventricle up into the aorta. So again, that's under a normal, healthy blood pressure situation. Let's say that somebody has terribly high blood pressure. So we're gonna go with a situation where their blood pressure is awful, it's 160 over 120. In that particular case, the average blood pressure through here is 133. And what that means is our afterload has increased so there's much more back pressure on the left ventricle. Effectively, in this situation, what the left ventricle is gonna have to do is generate 134 in pressure so that we have a higher pressure in the ventricle, a pressure that's higher than what's up here in the aorta, and that's going to, in this high blood pressure or after tension situation, allow us to move the blood from the left ventricle into the aorta. Basically, what this means is the higher that blood pressure becomes, the more back pressure, the more afterload there is on the heart. That means that the more the afterload increases, the more that back pressure increases, the more we're going to see the heart having to generate a higher force each time it contracts to move blood from the left ventricle into the aorta. So that's why hypertension, why high blood pressure, even if it's just a little bit elevated, is not good for the heart. Every time blood pressure goes up, the heart has to generate more force with each contraction due to that afterload or due to the back pressure. So here's the last slide that I wanna talk about where we start looking at um, how preload is affecting cardiac output, how contractility is affecting cardiac output, and how afterload is doing the same. So I mentioned, and here again is that little diagram, that preload is the rate basically at which blood is returning to the heart.
So if preload increases, maybe because you're exercising or whatever, that's going to set up a situation where the EDV is going to increase because blood is returning to the heart faster. So the heart's going to fill faster, EDV increases. And when our EDV increases, if you look down here at this formula, if this number increases, assuming everything else remains the same, that's going to cause an increase in stroke volume. And if you look at our formula for calculating cardiac output, if stroke volume increases, we're going to get an increase in cardiac output as well. Conversely, if preload has decreased because blood is returning to the heart slower for whatever reason, maybe you're sleeping, maybe you're calm and peaceful, if blood is returning to the heart slower, then the heart is going to fill with blood slower than it normally would. So in that case, we're going to see a decrease in EDV. If EDV decreases, assuming everything else remains the same, we're going to see a decrease in stroke volume and that's going to lead to a decrease in cardiac output. Contractility, you'll remember, is the strength with which the heart is contracting. So that's going to affect our ESV. If the heart is really contracting with a lot of force, maybe you're exercising, maybe you're stressed, your heart is pounding, whatever, when it's contracting with a lot of force, it's going to push more blood out of the ventricles than it otherwise would. And in that case, that means there's going to be less blood left in the ventricles at the end of systole. If there's less blood left in the ventricles at the end of systole, stroke volume increases, because if that blood isn't in the ventricles, that means it's gotten pushed out to the systemic circuit, so stroke volume has increased. And when stroke volume increases, we get an increase in cardiac output. If we have a situation where the heart's not beating with as much force, so we've got decreased contractility, then we have a situation where the heart's not squeezing as hard. If it's not squeezing as hard, more blood is going to stay in the left ventricle at the end of contraction. And in that particular scenario, because more blood's staying in the left ventricle, we're going to have an increase in ESV or an increase in the amount of blood in the left ventricle at the end of systole. If ESV increases, that means less blood is going into the systemic circuit, so our stroke volume decreases. When our stroke volume decreases, you guys know cardiac output is going to decrease as well. Afterload we've talked about, so again, that's that back pressure that we have on the heart that's represented by my little simplified drawing down there. When afterload increases. There's more back pressure on the heart. That means it's harder. The heart has to generate a higher force in order to move blood from the left ventricle into the systemic circuit. If that's the case, if it's harder for it to move blood, we're going to see more blood remaining in the heart at the end of systole, and that's going to increase our end systolic volume. When we increase the end systolic volume, that's going to cause our stroke volume to decrease because in this case, more blood staying in the heart, less is actually making its way into the aorta. If the stroke volume decreases, now we're gonna have a corresponding decrease in cardiac output. So remember, after load increases with hypertension, with more back pressure on the heart, and you can see one of the effects of increased after load um, of hypertension is that we get an overall decrease in cardiac output. So the heart's working harder, but the amount of blood that's actually getting to the tissues of the body to give up oxygen and nutrients to those tissues has actually decreased. If you have high blood pressure and you're on a blood pressure medication, or you don't have high blood pressure, you've got normal healthy blood pressure, then the afterload, that back pressure on the heart is decreased. And if there's not as much pressure resisting the movement of blood from the left ventricle into the aorta, what we're going to see is that blood's going to move easier from that left ventricle into the aorta, and that means there's going to be less blood left over in that ventricle at the end of contraction. So if we have less blood left over because more of it was pumped to the tissues of the body, we're going to see stroke volume increasing and when stroke volume increases, we're going to see an increase in cardiac output as well.